How's everyone doing tonight? This is Chopping It Up Hardcore with Hal Capone, discussion number 79. Tonight, my special guest is Paul Burdett from two of my all-time favorite bands ever. His hero is gone in tragedy. Uh, he was also in Death Threat, which is criminally underrated. Uh, Call the Police, Face Down, um, uh, oh, oh, Criminal Damage. Um, yeah, just so stoked to talk to him. Can't wait to talk to him. It's it's truly an honor. Uh, you know, those two bands are so special to me. Changed the way I started thinking about, you know, heavier, like, you know, crustier kind of bands. Paved the way for my influences in bands, too. Even though, like, we didn't sound like that. It, like, I was just totally flawed by those bands. It's, luckily, I get to see both of those bands live once. Um, so... Can't wait to talk to him. Hope everybody's good. Hope everybody's well. Wednesday night, kind of a weird, weird night. But uh, if my uh, voice starts breaking up, let me know because I might have to jet down the street. Hopefully, you know, everything's good, though, tonight. Instagram's a crapshoot sometimes with these things. Frankie, what's up, brother? We had to start a little late. He was running a little late from a job, so um, he should be here any second. Super stoked, though. I can't wait. This is this is like, <laughs> you know, up there for our talks for me. So I know it's crazy. Wednesday nights are tough. I got out of work, walked the dogs real quick, tried to eat something, and then here we are. You should be coming on any second. Sorry for the late start. Like I said, thank you for anybody that watches this or goes to my YouTube page and watches it. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, it's something. It's it's a great hobby of mine that I love to do. It's it's real fun. Um, you know, super anxiety ridden when I first started, but it's gotten a lot easier and. You know, things are run smoother now, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> so. But like I said, I'm su super stoked on this talk. Unbelievable. You know, I'm just lucky enough that he, you know, agreed to come jump on here with me because you don't hear too many interviews and stuff like that. I'm going to jump on, grab you right now. Paul, how you doing? Pretty good, how are you? Good. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Perfect, perfect. I'm trying to rotate the phone so I won't die here, but it didn't work. There we go. Perfect. Hey, I want to thank you so much for taking this. I know, I know kind of, you know, both of us were working, and, and Wednesday night's kind of a weird night, but... um. I appreciate you taking the time out to talk about the old old days and what you got going on now, and uh, it's truly an honor to speak with you. Yeah, sure thing, man. Thanks for having me on. Um, first off, I usually ask, the first question is kind of a two. I usually ask, what, you, what were you listening to before you got into hardcore and punk, and what was the first things that got you into hardcore and punk band-wise? Um. I mean, shit, I was in like fourth and fifth grade or something, so I was listening to Run DMC and Beastie Boys. I don't know. It's hard to remember when you're... I mean, I, I um, around that time, I think in fourth grade, my our older sister um, went to a... I don't know if they have it where you're from, in Tennessee, it was called Governor School. It's like, basically, kids that don't want to have a summer for some reason. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like smart kids that want to go to still be in school. Yeah, she came home from governor school. She was in high school at the time. She came home from governor school, listening to Fresh Fruit for Riding Vegetables and um, the Pogues, Run Run Sodomy and the Lash. 
I remember hate, hating the Pogues at the time, liking Dead Kennedys. It was a couple of years before kind of getting into that stuff, but you know, I don't think when you're when you're eight, nine years old, you don't really actively listen to music as much as what's around. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. Um, we, kind of when you were listening to Run DMC and, and Beastie Boys and stuff like that, was like um, Yo Baby raps a big thing for you back then, or or was that kind of yeah? Or what? what I mean, what, I, you know, I'm, I certainly remember having like Grandmaster Flash and breakdancing in the living room. As soon as my mom left, we'd break out some cardboard on the <laughs> carpet where we're supposed to be in and trying to do some windmills and shit. Yeah. Well, now, now, were you wearing parachute pants back then or or no? <laughs> I was just talking to a friend about this last night. We were talking about the 80s and I was like, man, I, I wanted some parachute pants really bad. <laughs> I don't think I ever had legit ones. I also wanted jams real bad. And I remember only being, my mom only being able to afford getting like some budget some, like Walmart <laughs> jet style jams. <laughs> Yeah, it was always running skids back then. You remember skids? Yeah, vaguely. I remember. We were, I, was about, I was just talking about ruse too. Yeah, and, and uh, cross colors. Did you ever uh, rock a pair of cross colors? Did you? I don't remember, know if I did. It was like all the crazy jean colors. It was like bright yellow and bright purple pants, and um, the skids had like corduroy on the front, and then it had like plaid on the back. It was that sounds terrible. <laughs> you found a better way to prop this thing up. Let's right, see if that helps. Um, so when when you were a kid, did skateboarding kind of bridge the gap as well? Because when I was talking to Kip, he had mentioned that Todd and you perhaps like went to his house back in the day and, you know, were skateboarding back then. Did that kind of bridge the gap between like hardcore kids, like getting into hardcore back then? Yeah, I mean, that's how, that's how I got into punk. I mean, I got into metal barely earlier so yeah like so i guess technically answer your first question a little bit of metal first yeah um but you know we'd get thrasher magazine and see at the time uh puss had had puss like puss zone the his little his uh column in the back where he'd be talking yeah. about all these bands from finland and parts of the world with you know especially finland with a bunch of a's and k's and pretty long ass names were like what the fuck is this shit but it was also probably like 80 yeah it was about 87 so it was right when a lot of punk and hardcore went either metal or new wave yeah so i mean i remember seeing ads for bad brains but it was bad brains quickness mm -hmm. or circle jerk seven so there's a bunch of that shit that i didn't even it took me years to figure out the bad brains were good yeah yeah i mean don't get me wrong at that age we lapped up anything so i i liked quickness but later i was like holy shit they were a hardcore man yeah 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 it's funny i i got to see bad brains once at the channel in austin and and it was the quickness tour i missed the early fortunately so uh but I mean, it was worth seeing anyways i don't mind quickness e either so um obviously i like the first stuff a lot better but black uh, dots the best yeah so so i was i was just lucky enough to see him once it didn't get better than black dots it's true. So recording is just fucking incredible. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Um, the story is they were, I believe it's Don Zianchura. Supposedly the story is they were all in separate rooms. They couldn't see each other. They could only hear through the headphones. Oh, really? And I believe it's a four track. Maybe I'm wrong about that part, but it certainly sounds pretty primitive. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I, I didn't know that. I just love how fucking raw it is. Like some of those songs are, I like how on the tape and then on the first LP that they, um, in a way, I like that they're faster, but some of those songs, I don't know, just the recording makes them, the rawness of it makes them so good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I agree. Definitely. But, I mean, sometimes you lose a little something going too fast. And it, I can only imagine how insane they would have been to see in like 1981 or some shit playing those songs at light speed. But. Yeah, the, yeah. I, unfortunately, I, I missed that. My, although, talking about the old days, my first show I saw SSD and uh, DYS yeah. uh, at the channel. And Angry Simones, I think it was, and I was real young. I think that was '83. I was 11, and I was scared shitless when I went to that show because I was a metalhead. I kind of had long hair, so I was like scared shitless of that show. So I kind of didn't go to shows until, you know, I loved the aggressiveness and the and the energy of it, but I really like I had to age a little bit to get you know get it, and I yeah. started shows um, totally in '87, '88. Yeah, I lived in the middle of nowhere in Tennessee, so I didn't have any 
any option for shit like that. I mean, first show I ever went, well, I went, there was a, a, a like the tiny town we had in, lived in had a, a metal festival. It was a bunch of Heshers just doing this. <laughs> I remember I got a bad crick on my neck when I was in sixth grade from that shit. But uh, I mean, first show, pretty first punk show I ever went to was one we played. Like me and, and my brother Todd and Billy who, Billy from Tragedy and Death Threat and um, like we started our first band together in 87, 88 or something. Or probably like 88. Yeah. And well, there weren't other punks. I mean, there were a couple other punks in town, but the first show we played was with death metal bands. So technically the first show of punk I show I went to was our show, but. Oh, no. Nice. But we'd go to shows in Huntsville or sometimes Atlanta. And even then it was like, it's just all skinheads. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I heard about that down in the south. There was a lot of skinheads. Uh, back, like back in the early '80s, there was a lot of skinheads up in, up in the Boston area. But um, that kind of phased out once there was there was like a, a gang called FSU that kind of weeded mm. at, as you know that time went on. But then the the scene got real violent up here, so I kind of took a break from it for a little while and then got back into it when it kind of died down because everybody was like getting beat up up here. So yeah, man, it was like you'd go to a show and there'd be. 400 people there and it'd be 200 it'd be like a 10 foot line down the middle be like sharps and anybody who's not a nazi on one side and yes. just nazis on the other side and it'd be like two separate pits people spill into the middle there'd be a big fight break out and of course the biggest motherfuckers were always nazis yeah <laughs> some like seven foot 300 pound dude with like <laughs> thighs for arms you know yeah jesus yeah. um so what was that first band called that you played that first Happy Death, Happy Death, and what became, became, became it, well, Happy Death. It became Stagnation. It was an equally horrible name. And so, so were you playing guitar at that point, or were you playing drums? No, I was playing drums. Drums. Now, the whole you... thing. I got a drum set for Christmas. It was a my a hand me down from a cousin, older cousin who played drums, and it was just shells. And so I can't remember how I scraped together. It took me a little bit to be able to play i think i had some like broken cymbals or some shit um but billy's dad played drums in in like a top 40 cover band so he had all equipment and so billy was able to show up with a guitar a bass and a bass amp and a guitar amp and my uh <laughs> this, this a friend of mine from church is a kid who got me into metal oh so really to watch it watch headbangers ball at his house on funny that's funny i knew him from church and at this point i was like already becoming an atheist and this kid was like i remember being like he had this huge slayer poster above his bed with you know carrie king with the big nails and shit and it was like something really fucking evil i thought it was kind of funny that that's how we knew each other yeah but he showed i remember he showed me how to play a power chord and i, I only could play the first two you know bottom two notes of it yeah it was the fifth or whatever and i just remember showing i think billy was playing guitar yeah showed Billy had to play that, or I, something like that. We just sat down and we just tried to play. None of us knew what the fuck we were doing. Yeah. So, so what was the first band that you actually played out in? Was was it? Um, we played. We played shows in that man. I mean, did. at like a skate park in Deckard, Tennessee, and and uh, we played. We played in Huntsville, and actually did that band. Yeah, I mean, we didn't play a whole lot, and then Todd went to college. And then, so me and Billy started a band with this kid, Daniel, who was kind of my best friend partner in crime through all of adolescence. Um, he was playing guitar, Billy on bass, it was called Face Down. Yeah. In Face Down, you you had a split with Cop Out, right? Was yeah. That, yeah, that's right. Um, so was that kind of like your first, like, real band that started playing out more in Face Down? Yeah, I mean, I was like, yeah, let's say so. I mean, you know, first band, I mean, Stagnation had a the four track demo we recorded ourselves that to my knowledge, nobody has anymore, which is a, a shame because it'd be horribly amazing to listen to, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but Face Down was the first band to record. So we had this, uh, going to shows in Nashville, this kid shows up one day in real, real heavy Yankee accent. He's all like from Connecticut. Yeah. And he was going to school at MTSU it's a big recording school at MTSU because you know Nashville music industry and all that shit. Um, and he said he wanted to put our band out, and so he recorded us at the school, you know, like in the school studio or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then he actually went on to 
he graduated and moved to Seattle and uh, recorded, was interning at Bad Animals and ended up, uh, while he was there, the guitar player from, shit, which band, what's that band? Um, not Stone Temple Pilots, what's the other Seattle, not Nirvana, but. Um, not, not, uh, not, not Smashing Pumpkins. No, the uh, dude with the real <laughs> voice. Alice in Chains? No, the other one. Uh. <laughs> anyway, dude from that band. Uh, God, I can't remember the name of the band. Jeremy Broken. Oh, uh, that's it. it's funny. That's the only song I can think of. Pearl Jam. Pearl Jam, yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So that dude was opening a studio and asked if anybody wanted to come work there. And he took a risk because working at Bad Animals was kind of like a big deal. Yeah. He took a risk and went and became the studio manager. And now he's recorded. Actually, he recorded the the first strategy seven inch. I guess the only, no, I guess we had more than seven inch. Anyway, can we, can we call this live seven inch um, at that studio actually? Yeah. Um, and he recorded ISIS and all kinds of other bands. Matt Bayless is his name. He's pretty well known. Oh, no kidding. Recording artist now. But yeah, so he used to put out that seven inch and record us. Now, how was the scene back then when you first started getting into it? Was was there a lot of metalcore down down in Tennessee, or what kind of what kind of scene was it? Well, like? well, 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 just hang on a second. Metal. Okay, so in Nashville, there was a whatnot. There wasn't really a punk scene. There was just yeah. some weird. I mean, yes, there was a punk scene, but it was. I don't know. It was just a little odd. Yes, yeah. kind of. I mean, coming from a small town, it felt almost more small town, or definitely wasn't anything cool there. Yeah. By I mean I mean that in kind of a good way. Although you know it would have been. Uh, there's a band uh, today is a day from there. I think they end up in Minneapolis and and got a little bit well known. At, like, yeah. They were on Amber Up. Um, yeah. I mean that drummer man. I remember just being like watching him was being blown away. That dude was just all arms, just like yeah. wailing yeah. everywhere. He was fucking amazing. Yeah, I remember. Let's see, Buzz Oven used to come around all the time. Um, bands from Chicago would come down. I mean, Buzz Oven, I saw Buzz Oven probably a dozen times. Man, during the Soar era, they were fucking unreal. There was that's, that's the third loudest band I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. The first two being Dinosaur Jr. and Dinosaur Jr. <laughs> yeah, Dinosaur Jr. is so good. Live. Holy fucking shit, were they loud. So good. But Buzz Oven, were, it was this tiny little record store, and uh, they were just, I was like, how is this band this fucking loud? And Neurosis is a really loud seen and played with nurses and they're they're really loud but buzz of them were just like fucking hurt hurt <laughs> loud singer was like at this point they got the second guitar player i'm pretty sure just so the is it kurt is that it kirk kirk i think it's kirk the singer mm -hmm. could like just be a scumbag on stage like just spitting all over the crowd like going behind the pa speaker and smoking crack and shit like in this tiny little record store with like 50 <laughs> people jesus or I don't know, I mean, you know that band John Henry West from... Uh, yep. Band? So they came around, and I just remember being like, members of Fuel, members of Fuel, was John, uh, or sorry, uh, Mike Kirsch, or Sarah Kirsch, um, Mike at the time, um, uh, and some relatively unknown band, there was seven people there, we, me, we were three of them, and they were the only band that played, and they just, they when they started playing it was just like the electricity was insane it went fucking ballistic yeah jumping off the amps and shit and like to do that with nobody there was just incredible it's good yeah now now did that kind of give you uh like an influence to start you know um obviously his hero is gone is is like super heavy uh what gave you that you know, how did you go in that direction where you were getting heavier and heavier? You know what I mean? Kind of straying away from the, the typical hardcore stuff, but getting almost like, but you know, at that time, Crust was just starting to, people were starting to get to know um, the term Crust, the punk bands. Um, yeah. I think His Hero Is Gone and like Asuk was like the first ones that I heard back then that kind of, you know, hit a light switch in my head where I was like, holy fuck, these bands are super heavy. Um, what kind of got you guys to that point of being in that vein of heaviness? Well, that band Face Down, we, we were like worshipped Neurosis, but Word is Era Law. Mm. I mean, Word is Law Era. When uh, yeah, when Souls of Zero came out, I remember just going to go to the store and buying the tape 
and me and my friend or all three of us in face down me and daniel and billy put it in and we're just like shocked like what the fuck it's metal what the fuck yeah is yeah i was uh, it took like a it, it took at least six months for me to really go to try and then of course now it's i think it's incredible yeah um but uh so that was the some influence on just that kind of like darker you know transylvanian sound and kind of parts but uh, i mean like i said buzz oven uh, i hate god there was a kind of a, a, a thing like that going on in the south like uh, initial state was a huge influence mm. like i i really liked uh Ant schism but when that initial state album came out i was just uh, i mean i owned it's one of several records i have probably maybe five records that i own doubles of only because I knew I either wore it out and wanted one that wasn't worn out, or I knew I was going to. <laughs> and that was one of them. I have, I have, I just, it's, I played it every single day for like a month or something. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Um, so how did yeah, you? I hate God. You know, there's okay. just actually, and then there was this, uh, there was a band, a band that preceded Cop Out. That one of the songs in the Cop Out Seven Inches, uh, a Tool song, and it was at least before the very popular band Tool became popular. I think. I don't know if they actually preceded the band, but basically it was a heavy hardcore band called Tool. Yeah. And that, they recorded a demo that was incredible and then Cop Out recorded over it to record their 7-inch, so nobody has it. Oh, no kidding. But it was fucking great. It was just that same kind of some tuned down heavy stuff. So that kind of stuff. And then, you know, we were listening to Bolt Thrower and, and like, never stopped listening to metal. I mean, I stopped listening to I mean, I don't know, even from the beginning, like that, that kid from church, they gave me a tape. It was like Van Halen, Wasp, Iron Maiden, Metallica, and I think Slayer. And basically I was like, Slayer, yes. Metallica is a, as a, not Red the Lightning, uh, Master of Puppets. Yeah. And, and basically like and Iron, Ma Iron Maiden, I was like, yes, but I didn't really like the, the other shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was metal too at that time, like back then. Um, yeah. It, it was funny. I was into heavy metal, kind of Iron Maiden, like you were saying, Judas Priest. Um, and then once I heard Metallica, I started getting into like Slayer, Exodus, Death Angel, all that, all that type of stuff. That I mean, people, people love talking shit about Lars Ulrich because I never even saw the movie about the the Metallica movie that everybody makes fun of him for about he just can't play a straight rock beat or whatever. Yeah. But I, mean, I think he was a fucking incredible drummer on, on all that early shit. Like, yeah. I don't yeah. know what happened or. If, if it obviously was capable and played that stuff. And I would say he was a huge influence for me. I mean, there's certain stuff that he, that I got from him. I still do to this day, like carrying drum fills past where it comes back in. Yeah. You know, and that, like, but you know, so there's that influence on the heavy stuff, but then, uh, I don't know, man, I gotta say there's maybe also just something about, you know, because when his heroes gone started, we're living in Memphis, and it was just a depressing place. And I, I can't help but feel like that had something to do with it. And, you know, when we started, we originally started as me and Todd and Carl, and that kid Daniel that I was talking about that I grew up with. Yeah. He kind of started, didn't know until years later that he actually just died a few years ago. Uh, not because of it, but he was schizophrenic. Yeah. And that stuff had started coming on, and he just started getting really weird. Yeah. And so we were looking for somebody else to play with and Todd and I were working at this donut shop in Memphis, River City Donuts, so kinda of like all the punks worked out. Um, with Pat, who was punk in a punk, but he was kinda of more into metal. Yeah. And you you know, like uh, like he loved Rorschach, uh, you know, more uh Protestant than you know, I'm kind of more of a sorry, what's first LP? Uh I mean a Protestant came out of fucking blew my mind. Yeah, or like Citizens Arrest, you know, especially the LPs got kind of a heaviness to it. So yeah, that shit was an influence for sure. But then Pat yeah. brought Pat definitely brought an influence of just like heavy playing, you know, the, a little bit of metal into it. Yeah, and the first thing you guys put out was the medicine, uh, like demo cassette thing. Right, and that was the first thing you guys put I don't out. I think it was actually called that, but yeah, yeah. How, how did they? How did I don't, they... I don't like. I don't think it actually had a name to be honest. It, or maybe it did. Maybe it did. I don't know. That's funny. I just pulled it out. I have a friend from Germany who's asking about it, and I was like, "Do I have any?" I was like, "No," but I have the original cassette master and the original artwork. But the way that we made the covers were, 
at the time Kinko's had, uh, they had just come out with re like it, printers that could also do copiers that could also do red and blue ink. Yeah. So kind of like screen printing, we would make, I made like three different, you know, three different covers You'd or three different parts. You'd run the black part through and then you'd put the new part in the top to copy and you'd run all the red through and all the blue through. <laughs> That's what it was. So like I have that shit, but now I'd have to figure out how to, I mean, I guess I could, I mean, I have like a laser copier back in my office right here, so I could probably figure that out, but you know. Yeah, so I, I think the first thing, um, the dead of night and eight movements was the first thing I heard. Um, and I and I bought the seven inch. And when I heard that, like I said, I was blown away. I was just like, holy shit, this band is so heavy. And I was talking to my friend Scott, who uh, later went on to sing in a band called The Network up here, with like a bit kind of like a brutal, heavy metalcore. And um, just a while after that 15 counts of arson, he had the CD and I raced out to go buy that too. So those were like the first two things that I heard and I was like completely blown away by those two releases like right off the bat. Um, in the early days, um, how were the shows when you guys first played before, you know, obviously you guys got huge in the underground scene as, as time went on, especially now I, you're super revered from like everybody. I mean, I talk to a lot of people and you know, you get the screamo people, you get the crust punks, you get the metalcore guys that always say, his hero is gone. It's like a huge influence on him. Um, how were those early days for you? And how was the reception when you guys first started? Because like I said, those first two releases are, are brutal as fuck. And, um, what do you think of that? I mean, honestly, I'm kind of detached from that shit you're, you're saying. Like, I, I, that's interesting to hear. And obviously, I know that people, I see his heroes going patches and shit. And I'm, I'm not like completely unaware, but I don't really have any idea. I mean, where um, it was fast and furious, and then we never saw it. We, I probably shouldn't say this, but we barely saw any record money after early 2000s. And so I have kind of, I have literally no idea how many records it sold or um, what the stuff you're saying is. But I mean, I can say what the early, I mean, early we were playing in like my bedroom. Mm. <laughs> Like well, literally, that's where we practice. And the time we had a show, like maybe ten people would fit in, or like, yeah, there was a house above a, a dent cleaners. Is how Memphis people would know it. But there was a there was like a cleaners and uh, like kind of a loft above it that had a living. You know, anybody that had a living room big enough to fit more than ten people in, you know, shows. Yeah, um, and I mean, our last show ever was in a, a little DIY space that we ran um, in Memphis to like twenty people, like twenty people or something. That's crazy. You know, we played like more than Music Fest. Of course, there were a ton of people there. Like towards the end of the band, more people were showing up to shows. Or like, we lived in Providence for six months and did, then did a tour back to Memphis. And I remember some of those shows. And we were playing in Albany, and pretty good crowd, and and so forth. But you know, it was it was kind of like when tragedy started, it started having more more people showing up, and you know. Yeah, I was gonna ask, relatively shortly up, I guess. I was gonna ask you about Providence. Like, what what made you guys move up to Providence? For I, I know I had read it some a long time, and and there's not much on it anywhere. So, what was kind of the move to go up there? Oh yeah, I have to. Uh, I have to, I just forgot another major influence, and that's uh, Uranus. Oh, so good. Yeah. So I graduated high school in '94, and Todd had joined Cop Out at that point. Like, so he had he had lived in Boston for a few years. And he moved back to Memphis. I graduated, graduated high school, moved to Memphis. He was playing Cop Out. They went on tour. I hopped in the van to Roadie for a month. Um, played in uh, Yannick's hometown uh, in Ontario. Why am I Bur not Birmingham? Uh, that's where it's actually from. So. God damn it. Why am I blinking? It's near Ottawa. It's like on the border of uh, Quebec and Ottawa. Yeah. Uh, Ontario. Um, it'll come to me. Anyway, we played, they, he had a little show space there and we played with them and I'd never heard of them at the time. They just had a demo out. Yeah. And speaking of loud bands, it was just like, holy, it was just like a wall of sound and they were so yeah. fucking heavy. Left with that demo. That demo became, I mean, it, some of the songs ended up getting recorded and then, if I remember right, I think that's the demo is what's on the His Hero Split. The split, mm -hmm. we ended up doing the His Hero's Gone. Yeah. Anyway, we stayed in touch with Yannick and um 
when Pat quit the band, we were trying to find somebody to play guitar and just kind of couldn't figure out anybody in town. And he seemed interested. And we, Todd and I were just like, let's, what about Yannick? Yeah. And uh, so we reached out to him and he was, he was really into it. And he, I mean, then the rest of history kind of, but then he would come down to Memphis or like take a fly to St. Louis because it's the cheapest. And then we'd have to go pick him up or take a bus or some shit. Like, you know, we we're all just like scraping by. Bro. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that only lasts so long to the idea. Like, we weren't happy living in Memphis. We are like, let's move somewhere in between. Yeah. So we decided on Boston because Todd had lived there and knew people. And it was only five hours from Montreal. Um, but then I had a girlfriend that from uh, New Orleans that was doing, like, a whatever it's called in college when you do, like, a semester somewhere else. Yeah. Oh, uh, abroad? What's that? What, the study abroad? No, it's like when you do a semester in a different school. There's oh, not a job. it's just like a whatever. Yeah. She was doing a semester, and she was an art school in at Tulane. She was doing a semester at RISD. Yeah. And so I went out a couple of weeks early to hang out with her, and basically get there and find out that like Providence was cheap as fuck, and the room that we were going to stay at in Boston didn't work out. So we just decided to stay in Providence. And we had like it was like Memphis prices. I think it's not like that at all now, but it was. We had I found us a four bedroom house for three hundred dollars and we lived in this neighborhood where like people would throw out i don't know like the very first night we went out and just people throw out big gar it was also like the college it was like i can't think of the timing was right for you know people throw out stuff when they go home for the semester kind of thing yeah. i don't know i just remember walking around and being like here's a whole plate set here's here's uh the couch basically we furnished a whole whole house for free the first night we lived there and <laughs> so did a short stint there and so what did you think of the Providence scene when you guys were up there? Uh, it was cool. I liked it a lot. Um, I mean, the only people we knew there were drop dead. Yeah. And well, coincidentally, what's funny is I was trying to surprise my my girlfriend that I was going to meet. So I just took a, I flew to Boston and then took a train to Providence and then had her address, but I didn't know where the fuck I was going. <laughs> and I, I roll out of the train station with a backpack on and a skateboard and I skated like 50 feet and there's a van parked there. And I was like, Ben, and he looks over and he's like, Hey, Paul, <laughs> what the fuck are you doing here? Like, <laughs> then he gave me a ride to where I was going. So, and it was cool. So knowing those dudes and then getting to know him better was rad. And then, you know, there was, yeah, that's really good people there. I mean, kind of weren't there long enough to get to know a whole lot of people, but there was this, uh, Fort Thunder is like kind of like yeah the yep I know what you're talking about I've done yeah, that like a little warehouse of like art school kid kind of music yeah. and uh, yeah I'm trying to remember there was Aaron yeah there's like uh, oh, what was Aaron's band at the time uh, anyway yeah and getting to know the drop dead dudes even better was rad like those dudes are those dudes are awesome salt of the earth yeah. Good For Fort Thunder was fun. I, I saw a crazy Converge show there before. Packed. It was like, it was unbelievable. Um, were you into kind of like the New England scene too at that time? Like, you know, maybe not the style you guys were playing, but like Converge and Cave In and, and Bane and, and bands like that. I never that. liked any of that shit. No? No. I was going to say earlier when you asked about uh, metalcore and stuff, I was going to say, I do know that you know, some of that stuff kind of basically started in Memphis with Raid and uh, that and that kind of earth cry. You know, they were like the original yeah. vegan warrior people showing up with like guitars in machine gun cases, you know, like gun cases and shit. Like yeah. uh, the whole like hardline thing started in Memphis and then came more of a, a New York kind of thing or upstate New York, I guess. But um, yeah. no, I never really, it's kind of funny because there was even a, uh, one time Death Threat was recording in South Carolina and Two Word Death Threat were playing a show there and supposedly there was this rumor they wanted to beat us up and all this stuff. And like, <laughs> we were joking about we were going to go to the show and then we just recorded late. But then ironically, years later, I ended up marrying a woman from Connecticut who grew up with them and through them ended up getting a message that they were like, no, we, we, we liked your band a lot. We wanted to do a Death Threat, Death Threat. Oh, no. Nope. 
But no, was, I mean, I, you know, I grew up on like straight edge hardcore, like the classics, but I didn't really like, once it got a little too kind of jockey yo-yo for me, it was, I just call it yo-yo hardcore. Yeah, yeah. No, no that, that like once, once the dancing became like some crazy like arms whipping around and picking up change off the floor or picking carrots and shit, it's kind of yeah out of, out of different world for me. Yeah, I kind of got wild with the spin kicks and the, you know, <laughs> all the wild kicking that was going on, you know what I mean? Uh, um, it did get crazy after a while. I mean, um, you know, there's a fine line between, you know, I like early integrity. Yeah. And there's a fine line when that stuff changed over. I mean, like, you know, today we're wearing, like, night look like kind of like jock kids sort of it, later on, especially. So, yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah. I guess it's just a bit of a different world. Yeah, the funny thing, because you say that, is I dressed like those those jock kids back then, but I listened to like the heaviest music, so I didn't really. They were always like, "Oh, who's this youth crew kid coming to you know an ass suck show?" You know, <laughs> so I was always kind of. Well, now I can look back and see that there's definitely like a cultural thing. There's like definitely like a northeast, more of a suburban kid vibe versus, I mean. To be honest, there's a lot of poverty in the South and Memphis, especially. I mean, people were fucking dirty as fuck. I remember when I moved there, all the punks were just like, everybody had dreads. And there was one dude who, I remember his feet, his shoes, boots rotted to his feet because he didn't take them off for like three months or something. <laughs> like, Thanks. People were kind of <laughs> nasty. <laughs> but, you know, there was like, it, to me, there felt like the punk world and, and that kind of hardcore world were like a little bit different. But then, you know, I'd go play in a place like, um, not was anywhere, just about anywhere in New Jersey or something like that, and it's just it, it, it realize it's just people are just different in different places, and yeah, yeah. You know, I'm 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 a pretty clean guy these days. I don't, you know, it's it's like I said it's like a cultural a cultural thing, especially just being a young punk, and you know, at the same time, I I never understood the like whole like liberty the the postcard punk, thing. yeah, you know. Now, now, when Yannick, Yannick's first thing was Monuments of Thieves, right? That was the first thing he was on. Yeah. And then, and so, so did you feel, you know, things were going good at that point once he joined and, and kind of what, what made his heroes gone like end? What was the end point for you guys? Was it because you wanted to move to, I know y'all moved to Portland. Um, what was that, like the ending of heroes gone? You know, I don't want to get too much into interpersonal stuff, but there's some interpersonal stuff. Yeah. Um, we were going to, we were trying to move and Carl wasn't as interested in moving and we had done some extensive tour. You know, it's hard to be in a van with anybody for a long time. We'd not only done some extensive touring, we'd moved across the country and, and uh, I don't know, I mean, that's, there's, especially when you love people you play music with, talking even, I can talk lightheartedly with people I played in bands with the stuff didn't work out with. Yeah. But there's, a, there's, there's an element of a, the personal side of things that I think is should stay personal. So yeah, yeah just, no. things just didn't kind of, there were tensions and things didn't kind of, didn't work out. Yep. Now, now touring back then with his hero was gone. What was like your favorite tour that you guys did? I know you you went to Japan, right? Mm-hmm. And, and and you did a Europe tour too. Were those your favorites or was the States? Like, I know you guys did the States extensively over and over again. I mean, what were kind of your favorite tours back then? Um, that's hard to say, because I mean, special part in my heart for driving around the, like, who the fuck decided, like, after moving to Portland, I was like, never gonna tour the States in the summer ever again. <laughs> it was like it was beautiful here in the summer. Yeah. Driving around in a van with no air conditioning, and like we had this, we had this van that had it was like a one of those custom vans with shit built into it, you know. Yeah. Because the there was like a it used to be a fridge in the back or something, but we load the drums into the back, behind the back seat, and then all four speaker cabinets went face down or face up, whichever way, yeah. on the floor between the back seat and the two front seats, and then we had a piece of plywood with a hinge on it that went on top of that yeah. and that was basically the loft and then at one point we had to actually build a loft and so there was a loft 
between the bench seat and the front seat. So the only way to get between was either climb over or you couldn't even really climb in the back door. You basically had to climb in the front, climb all the way over and then find yourself dumped into the back. And you're driving around like a hundred degree weather in the, and, and, you know, getting, running out of gas in small towns and having to like ask, pull up to a cop shop or church and be like, fill our tank and we're stuck here. <laughs> or like, you know, being like, can we afford peanut butter and jelly? Yeah. On the other hand, like, you know, amazing stories from shit like that. Japan, I mean, for fuck's sake, we asked, we played with gauze and judgment and, and like nightmare and warhead. Yeah. And forward and the amount of, I mean, at this point I mix up a little bit of who we played with. Yeah. Then and then with tragedy and death threat. Um, but that first tour was the first place I'd been in the world where it felt like dramatically different. You know, yeah. everybody drives on the left side of the road and it really felt like everything was like that. Like the whole world was upside down. Yeah. And, you know, I think all, all of us were vegan at the time, which is just really fucking hard to eat, even vegetarian. And eventually going back, we figured stuff out and it got a lot easier, but it was just so culturally different. And the manner in which you're touring was so different and it was only 10 days or something, but it felt fucking brutal. Because the thing is uh, you're jet lagged for a week. So basically you're there jet lagged, fucked up, starving, confused. Yeah. And seeing amazing bands and shit. So I don't know. I, I almost say that Europe tour maybe, mm. but it was, it was pretty rough too. I mean, we had somebody booked our, booked our tour, but then didn't finish booking it. And this before, I mean, I guess it wasn't before the internet, but it wasn't as pervasive and we didn't have smartphones and shit. We just had like a big thick map of Europe and halfway through the tour, we were run out of like, we know we have a show here, but we don't know. We don't have directions. We don't know where we're going. Yeah, and this dude, uh, Martin, uh, we called him Martian from uh, Czech Republic, he ended up hopping in the van and he would just sniff his way to the show. He'd be like, for sure, I know there's a train station near here and like take us to like, I mean, you just like find the show. So, yeah. Wow, that's it. That's, that's so, I mean, it was also kind of crazy. And most of the shows, there was nobody there, but it was also just, you know, new place and experience. So it was pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, and and when you did the states, was there any bands that you played with that kind of opened your eyes where you didn't know who they were, and then you played with them, and you were like, "Holy shit, this band is like incredible!" And then maybe became friends with them uh, back then. Yeah, I'm, yes, but I, I I'm sure, but I have to think about it because you know there are a lot of bands. I mean, let's say in that time period for sure. I mean, I, I remember Word Salad. I met when they played in Memphis. Mm. And they're staying at a friend's house who showed up and they were all sitting around like catching cockroaches and then lighting them on fire and eating them. And <laughs> they're just like, I remember, yeah, playing in Albuquerque used to be a gnarly place to play. Uh, one time there was a 24 hour diner there called the frontier that was like four security guards, armed security guards. always really? there. <laughs> and uh, we used to book tours on these, they were called tone dialers. You could, you know, if had a rotary phone or whatever, Yeah, grandma has a rotary phone and then they invented touchstone phones so you could go to radio shack and get a little thing that you held up to it that you could do the tones oh, you know, press yeah. one for whatever right so yeah. you could also go to radio shack and buy some little chip to replace it where the tones changed yeah and the, the pound sign made the sound of a nickel and so you could program it to go like one would be like beep you could program it to go and that would be a quarter yeah you go to you go to a pay phone and you know, put a, a number in and say, please deposit $2. And you just hit the memory button. <laughs> and so we booked whole tours that way. We had like whole phone booths removed from places could be like hundreds of dollars of calls and they show up and there's no money, around, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, and there's one time I was outside of the frontier and a uh, word salad had taken us there. And this skinhead comes coming by and he's got like white lace boots on his uh, cup, you know, Blue jeans all cuffed up and like just a plain white t-shirt on, but like swazi tattoos and shit. And he's just bouncing an aluminum baseball bat on the ground and all fucking mathed out or some shit. And it's like walking up. He's like, hey, did you see these guys? And I was just like, yeah, they went that way. Just me, you know. <laughs> yeah. and I'm just sitting there like talking to my girlfriend at home like, holy shit. So, uh, you know, I met those dudes before, but there's definitely a lot of people who got to know a lot better for sure. Yeah. There was tons, tons of people. You know, talk to Poison, new Know William from from Memphis, but I got to know Brian and yeah, this dead and gone 
I think also knew from Memphis, but we always used to stay dead and gone house and in Oakland, especially when we ended up recording there. So yeah. Met lots of met lots of people and still good friends with to this day. So when his hero is gone, Death Threat started kind of were you did you already start Death Threat before his hero is gone kinda of ended? Was that kind of a thing before? No, um I don't think he cares been saying this, but Billy had gone to prison when we were kids and he got out in ninety five and uh moved to Memphis mm -hmm. and we wanted to so me and Todd and me and Todd and Billy had grown up together and played music together, so we wanted to start a band. Yeah. But Todd and I already had his heroes gone, so we're like, why don't you play drums and I'll play guitar kind of thing? And uh Yeah. So now that was uh let's see, when we started though, he moved I don't remember exactly what started, but yeah, zero's gone. It's already gone. Yeah, um, Death Threat I feel is underrated. Like I don't, feel, I I don't feel like enough people give that band enough shine to me because that band was so good too. Um, um, it, it and you guys kind of went back into sounding more of the traditional hardcore sound. Was that kind of a, a thought in your head to kind of go back a little bit to not so dark in in you know, heavy sounding, more of like a traditional hardcore sound, but faster. Yeah, I mean, we were sort of trying to do, yeah, we were just trying to do hardcore. Mm. So that was, you know, in that time frame, that was, yeah, so mid 90s, it was maybe a slight throwback to youth crew kind of stuff. Yeah. But at the same time, we were also, at that time, there was so much Japanese and Swedish shit that we were really getting into that, you know, yeah. I just noticed, I had to notice that there were people talking down here at the bottom. First off, Ian, phone <laughs> dialed. And yes, Martin and Bruno. Bruno. Martin once, we once played a tragedy show where uh, Martin, he DJed and he, uh, one of our songs, he did scratching on stage. Oh. Yeah. oh. <laughs> did we know that? Um, I don't know. I hope so. Oh, that would be great. I would definitely see that. Yeah, that's good when the comments go because they just go by and then after this saves, you, the comments don't stay, which is kind of oh, okay. which is kind of shitty. So I've I mean, never done this before. I never even really looked at live things on here before. So yeah, uh, figuring it out. Um, so what kind of led you to Portland? What? How come? I mean, it's kind of far away from Memphis and Providence, and and what kind of got you to Providence, uh, Portland? Uh, default honestly we didn't want to live in Memphis it was um, the the northeast the living close to each other thing failed Yannick didn't want to move to Memphis we didn't really want to live there mm -hmm. and we couldn't agree on anywhere so it was prob I mean sorry uh, Portland or Philly and the only person we knew in Portland was uh, Neil from Tribal War and so I had he had driven, he had been on that like Primate Freedom Tour thing that uh, Oi Ployd, because he was going to play some shows with Oi Ployd on that. Yeah. Just, I think, that summer. Uh, so I got in touch with him and he hooked me up with a, a room to sublet. So I moved here just not knowing anybody but him. And I don't know, it worked out good. And you guys liked the, the area and stuff like that once you got out there? Was it kind of easy to get acclimated out there? Oh, no, it was hard. I mean, people weren't real friendly at first. I mean, the house we moved into, people were really friendly. I'm still friends with most of those people. Yeah. I mean, There's a family that I lived with at the time uh, with two kids, and I'm, I'm still friends with all of them to this day. They're one, the the seven-year-old is now like 28 or something, and I was teaching him some carpentry and is just asked for a referral for the Carpenters Union. Oh, nice, nice. And, uh, the, yeah, they're awesome people. Uh, Dennis Dredd draws records for metal bands if you've heard of them all he's, he's an artist yeah um, uh people who just weren't you know it was like an insular scene it was a small insular scene and people didn't like outsiders um and moved here and i got here in november everybody trickled in early jan december early january kind of thing yeah i got to the house by then um but you know it's just it's pretty shit weather <laughs> yeah you know, to do it and uh I don't have a car or anything, so I ride a bicycle around the Northwest. But, you know, it's a, and then the summer comes around, and it didn't take long. 
at this yeah. point I've lived here longer than anywhere else and it's definitely home. So I can't I can't speak for anyone else, but obviously everybody stayed here. Yeah, yeah. So is that kind of what how tragedy happened? Is because you guys kind of wanted to move somewhere and, and start a new band and start start something fresh? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, we there was a minute where we were actually the deal was we were gonna if we couldn't think of a name by January thirty first or something like that, we were gonna keep being as heroes gone. Mm -hmm. And then without a name, and we didn't, and just kind of felt like we didn't want to keep playing those songs, and kind of wanted to do something new. So yeah, yeah. And, and now is tragedy still? I know Fury came out in twenty eighteen. Is uh, is it still we gonna hear another tragedy album in the near future or not near future, but I don't know. We haven't played in a while. Yeah. But yeah, definitely not in any near future. Yeah. And and speaking of that too is is uh, will there would there ever be like his hero is gone reunion show for maybe possibly like a benefit or something like that? Could would that would you be up for that at all? I know a lot of people ask that. <laughs> so I would I highly doubt it. It's been we've been offered stuff before play mdf and to play things and i feel like there has even been an, i don't know you know there's an especially i feel like in particular that band was kind of fast and furious and there's an energy that i'm not sure could be recreated i know i can't play drums like that anymore even if i could physically play the parts i was like animal yeah that... i can't i can't move that fast anymore <laughs> I, know, I, I mentioned today as a day earlier that dude was just like arms everywhere and then the other one was Brooks from uh, from Born Against mm. he that dude was every single drum hit was as hard as he could hit it and I was yeah. like yeah I need to do that yeah. don't was out you gotta hit it everything as hard as you can <laughs> so and eventually that led to okay that means I can't try to do this as fast as I can you gotta do what you know, you, I know what I know I can do in order to say, when you play with people that don't want to turn their amps down, then you got to figure out how to stay loud. Yeah. So musically speaking right now, are you working on anything um, at all at this present day? Yeah. Um, well, I had a band. I just saw Aaron uh, Freitas popped on. I don't know if you still watch him. He's popped on a minute ago. Um, before, before COVID, um, we had a band going kind of, I don't know if it killed it, but it, you know, we were in the middle of recording. We had just recorded got I sang and play guitar in that band and uh got in finished everything we just haven't mixed it um but then uh kind of from your neck of the woods you know Adam Gandelman from he was in Sleeper Cell when he's out there mm. Eric Hall and Wild Mohican and shit out here um anyway I got a band with yeah him and uh got Ian um doing hardcore hardcore stuff yeah. playing drums which feels real good to play drums again and what what's the band names on on that? Uh, neither has a name. No no name yet. Mm -mm. Um, with this live, usually it cuts off after an hour because I had gotten uh, pinched a little while ago. <laughs> like I said, I, I I posted something that was against their guidelines a while ago. So they usually show. Uh -oh. um, I usually do a rap a rapid fire at the end, so I'm just gonna keep talking until it it like it should end in maybe about. Yeah, Aaron, let's do it. Sorry, Aaron just said, let's finish. I'm like, that's right. <laughs> in, in like seven minutes, it'll probably end. And then what we'll, we'll do is I'll just upload it and then I'll start again. And then we can do the rapid fire and, I, and I'll let it go. Because uh, sure. I get the rapid fire in as well. Um, I also wanted to ask, is there any His Hero Is Gone songs that never got released that, that you're holding on to that maybe, you know, would ever get released soon? I know some bands record things and they never put them out and it's just sitting there. Probably, and no. I mean, there was stuff that was, we recorded basically demo stuff. Um, I think before Plot Sickens, that one song ended up on a comp or something. It was pretty shitty recording. I think some of it ended up somewhere, but yeah. I, I'm pretty sure. I know there's a bunch of tragedy songs that outtakes that never ended up in anything, but I don't. To be honest, I don't really remember. Yeah, yeah. And with tra tragedy touring, I mean, you literally, y'all went everywhere, like all over Europe, like like literally everywhere touring. Was that something that you ever thought would happen um, with tragedy? Just just the just touring all over the world, basically. 
I mean, not really. I mean, it depends on, you know, but when we started, the Zero was gone, had gone to Europe and Japan, so it didn't, the possibility felt open. Mm-hmm. But, you know, shortly thereafter, Death Threat went to Mexico, and at the time, we were told we were only the second or third non-Latin or Spanish, uh, like, Spain's coming from Spain, Spain all the time, or yeah. other parts of Latin America. Um, yeah. We were told we were only the second or third, like, DIY kind of band that had come from the States. I think it was, like, DS-13 and, not DS-13, um, what was Havoc's band? Anyway, it was, it was, like, somebody, like, I think maybe Fleas and Weiss did or something, but. Oh, <laughs> really? Anyway, you know, and we were always just kind of, even when we, even every time we've gone anywhere, like, when we've gone, we get flown to a festival, we're, like, you know, I got flown the last time we toured. We got flown to a festival in in uh, Netherlands, and because they're paying paying the tickets, we're like, well, let's go play places out of the way places. We're gonna lose money. Yeah. And almost every time, those places would kill it. Like playing Latvia and Lithuania, or we got flown to play this festival in Finland. So we're like, let's go to Russia. So we went to yeah. Moscow and St. Petersburg, and and like we didn't like really make money, but we didn't lose money in those places because most of the time you go to tiny out of the way places and people are stoked and yeah. really into it. So. I don't know. I don't know how to answer whether I ever expected that, but I can tell you that I'm incredibly grateful for the experience, and think it's incredible that this culture exists that across the fucking world. Like going and playing Southeast Asia and yeah, Malaysia and Indonesia, people are like they had to in, in outside of Kuala Lumpur, people had to they had to they couldn't afford to bribe the cops in Kuala Lumpur, so we played at a resort outside of town oh, really it was like a field with a there's a yeah there's a video on youtube it was like a field with tarps for a roof and there's like in the middle of a huge i'm the whole time i'm playing i'm going to take my drumstick and push the tarp up so that it's not touching my head with water <laughs> it was fucking amazing and i don't know i hell no i could have never expected that but it's i feel damn grateful that i got that experience yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, now, was there any bands that Tragedy played with that kind of opened your eyes too? Um, do you remember any bands that you played with? Uh, or did, did you have a sister band that was like a special tour that you did back then? Back then, Or even, you know? I think it was more that like we'd go places and we'd be like, we're going to go to this place. We want to play with this band that we love. Because we were all, especially the other three dudes were like way more record collectors than me. But even I, I loved international. They were more collectors like doubles and triples and shit and traded stuff. I was more like, I want the records and shit. Like, yeah. But when it'd be like, we're going to Japan, it'd be like, fuck yeah, can we play with Gauze? Yeah. I was going to, you know, like, can we play with Meanwhile and Totalitar and in Sweden? So it's kind of more like that. But yeah, for sure, there were like surprise bands that, I don't know, again, it's kind of hard to think of off the top of my head. But uh, actually, I was just talking to Adam Candleman when we were on our way out recording the other day about this band from Hakadate, where in Japan, which is uh, uh, where Crude and Mustang and Balance are from, this band called uh, Butterfly. It was like, to my yeah. knowledge, they only put out a demo, but he went and found it on YouTube. Yeah. And so I don't know what exactly how to put it eye-opening, except for that it's just rad when you play some someplace and there's somebody you never heard of that blows you away. Yeah, yeah. Definitely experienced a fucking lot of that. We got a, a minute and 35 left there. I got the countdown. So when this ends, I'll end and then I'll jump back on and then we can, we can do the rapid fire. Um, sure. I saw I saw a tragedy in New Hampshire, actually, where I live. Um, you played with Drop Dead and I don't. I think it was Regan Youth, possibly, at mm-hmm. the Dover uh, Brick House in yeah. Dover, New Hampshire, back in maybe 2013. Wait, that was a, I thought we played with Regan Youth in, uh, in Portland, Maine. Maybe it was that. Maybe that too. I think. Yeah, I think we made did, maybe did two or three shows on that tour with them. Yeah, I think it was back to back. I think it was Dover, New Hampshire, one day, and then Portland the next day. And yeah. uh, and I don't yeah. know. If Drop Dead played in Portland, but you, Drop Dead definitely played in Dover. I don't think they did. No, I don't. I mean, no. I mean, I made in Portland. Yeah, they didn't play in Portland. I don't. Yeah. I think Reagan Youth did though. Um, yeah, they did. And uh, and I was talking about the Safari Lounge show where I saw his hair was gone, but I I got there late and I just got to see see that that you guys like came on. I got there. I just remember there was a giant like uh, a projector screen TV with wrestling playing the whole time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that 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 club was so weird. Definitely. Um, well, I got we got twenty seconds, so give me maybe like five minutes to get this set, and then sure. I'll, I'll, we'll do the same same thing. Um, so we'll. I got 10 seconds left. Instagram, 
good crapshoot. You ne you never know what you're gonna get with Instagram. But um, I will see you in five minutes. All right, man. Sounds cool. Thanks.